Today's webinar is on CFDs. Well, with that being said, let's go ahead and start our topic for today. So, today's topic is on trading Forex and CFDs. And the reason why, you know, I wanted to kind of bring this subject out is because the market is evolving and people as a whole are is evolving. And this is something that, you know, was going to be a natural consequence of time. I've been doing this for 10 years now. So keep in mind, you're talking, you know, way back in 2001. In 2001, the brokers that were offering retail Forex products as a whole weren't really offering CFDs and they weren't making them available. It was such a new market at that time and there was very little education about retail Forex because Forex at that time was really just traded by institutional investors and traders. And once it opened up to the retail market, there was, we started a new learning curve. And it was something that was going to take some time for people to get a lot of experience in the market, for the people who already were traders to start trading Forex because it was now available to them and to start getting their skill level up with it and for them to eventually become ed educators. And then those educators, as they went on through the market years and years and years, got better and better. So the overall level of information and education, you know, since the beginning of the retail forex market has really grown a lot. And that raises the overall level of the knowledge base. So the barriers for entry to become a successful trader in some sense are reduced because there's just a lot more information out there. You know, if you think about how many documents and how many pages on the web there were about forex trading, in 2001, it's not even comparable to now. It's, it's exponentially different. And so that, as a whole, just ma making that information more available, you know, as a whole, should accelerate the overall learning curve and people's experience of getting into this market. What happened then, as time went on, what became popular was a change in the environment. Before, if you wanted to trade as a whole, as a retail trader, if you wanted to trade, say, stocks, you had to do it off a stock platform. If you want to trade futures, you had to do it off a futures platform. If you wanted to trade commodities, you know, maybe you did it off a futures platform, a very specific platform. But all the platforms were kind of separated as a whole. It was much harder to get everything within one platform. Very few platforms were offering, and very few brokers were offering multi-product platforms, you know, where you can get an access to an entire suite. As time went on, and the demand for this increased, a lot of brokers, particularly offshore, started opening up their platforms so that people who were just trading retail Forex could now trade CFDs, or contract for difference, is what they're also known as. They could trade spot metals. You know, they could trade precious metals. They could trade uh, futures. You could trade indices. You could trade all these things in one platform. And that kind of changed the game a little bit in the sense that before you had to kind of go to those platforms that were trading those markets and then add Forex in as a product or you had to trade as a separate product. Now people who are trading Forex all of a sudden access to all these other products. They're now being made available on one platform and it happens to be where that platform is offering Forex, is offering these other CFDs here. So now we're getting into an environment where a lot of these are becoming more popular. You know, oil is something that is becoming, trading oil is becoming more popular. Trading gold and silver is becoming more popular. Trading indices as a whole is starting to increase in popularity. The ones that get the most press as a whole right now lately have been commodities, precious metals, gold, silver, uh, oil has been getting a lot of popularity. So the commodities and the CFDs that people are moving into from retail trading Forex into the CFD environment tend to be those three. But people are also starting to move in indices. And so since this is now becoming a more and more common and popular thing, it requires and is starting another learning curve all over again. It's starting a learning curve in the sense that there are a lot of people who the first time they just got into this, got into financial markets, was through Forex. And 
so because they were entering the market through Forex, they have learned methods that are kind of more calibrated to those environments. And it's not something that you necessarily just want to completely interface your same strategies on trading Forex into trading, you know, precious metals, indices, CFDs, etc. This is not something you just want to interface over and expect it all to work. Ideally, if something is a good model, a good system, they tend to be either uber calibrated in the sense that they're specifically tailored towards one instrument, you know, let's say a currency pair, or they tend to be very malleable in the sense that they can interface well with other instruments. You know, if the model works on one, it can often work on others if it's not hyper-tailored or specifically built just for that instrument. So with that being said, it's important to understand that when we trade CFDs and we see these things on our MT4, that we don't just jump in and treat them exactly the same as a currency because they're not. They're completely different. In some sense, there's one of the most obvious differences is that when you're trading currencies, you're really trading two instruments against each other, and you're trading that relationship. But when I'm trading oil, I'm just really trading oil. You know, I'm not trading necessarily oil versus this, you know, per se. You can trade oil priced in euros, and you can trade oil priced in dollars, and that does have a bearing on the relationship and the movement of it. But as a whole, if oil is going up for the day, it's going to be going up whether it's you know trading against you know it's going up strongly for the day. It's generally going up strongly against everything. So, with that being the case, you know it's not quite the same as trading pure currencies. In some sense, you have less variables that you have to monitor. When I'm trading New Zealand against the U.S. dollar, I have to be aware of how New Zealand is as a whole and how New U.S. dollar is as a whole and what that relationship is. Not the same in CFDs. So does everybody get that kind of base level of information that I'm talking about there when I'm talking about trading, CFDs, the learning curve, the introductions to that? Does everybody kind of get, does everybody feel comfortable with that information so far? Yes, no? Feel free to ask questions at any point in time. I want this, I want you guys to feel comfortable with all this information. I want you guys to feel like you're getting everything you need. So flash crash, Yaki. Good to see you again, Yaki. Philip, seek you. Fantastic. Okay, great. One of the things that I often see with beginning or developing traders is to think of things in such black and white terms. Um, and what you know, it's and, and part of it is just really a lack of experience and lack of information. That will go away in time, but it's very common that traders tend, beginning and developing traders tend to think of things in very black and white terms. You know, in the sense of, well, gold is going up, so Aussie dollars should be going up, or things like that. And part of this is really a misunderstanding of a very fundamental relationship, which has to do with correlation. People seem to think that if two instruments have a very high correlation, that if one thing happens, the other thing should happen. But what people forget is that correlation does not equal causation. It is not an immediate and guaranteed direct cause of the other. So gold going up isn't necessarily going to automatically equate to Aussie dollar gaining in value doesn't always mean that. And this can be very difficult for beginning and developing players to think in gray terms. It it takes a lot more information, skill, and ability to think in gray terms than it does in black and white. That's why beginning traders tend to like very black and white situations because they don't have to make as much decisions and they don't necessarily have the information to say, hey, well, you know, with this and this and this here, you know, it may mean this or may mean this. No, it just means this. 
you know, and so it's much easier to think in those terms. But it's important to understand that correlation does not equal causation. How does this relate to CFDs? Well, if you look at the general list of CSDs that are available, they're generally into particular categories. You have, for example, on an MT4 platform, in fact, let's go ahead and change the cam on this one here. Okay, I'm not sure if you just see the chart on MT4 or you actually see the whole platform. Maybe just the chart, but on an MT4 platform, let's say you are just the chart. Okay, that's good to know. So. If you are a non-U.S. resident, then trading CFDs is pretty easy. But if you're a res U.S. resident, you generally only have two, really, you know, two options to trade CFDs, because in the U.S. they have certain regulations around them. One is you open up an offshore corporation, and you trade funds through that offshore corporation. Um, and there's tremendous advantages to having an offshore corporation, but that's not what this class is about. So. That's one way to trade it if you're a U.S. resident. The other way to trade it is to be an accredited investor, such as you have $1 million in liquid cash. Once you have $1 million in liquid cash and you're considered an accredited investor inside the U.S., then it doesn't matter whether you are domiciled there or not. Um, you can... You can trade that. There's, uh, you can, you can kind of start moving into offshore brokers. There's a lot of offshore brokers that will say, okay, you have a million dollars in you know, liquid cash. You're an accredited investor. That being said, you, you know, you can come over. And part of that really has to do with savviness and risk. You know, they feel like, okay, if you have that much money, then you have a certain level of skill and savviness that, you know, you're not going to get destroyed by trading CFDs. The reason is in the states when you're trading these instruments you're not trading them on heavy margin. So you're not, or you're not trading them on heavy leverage. But CFDs, when you're trading them overseas, can offer a massive amounts of leverage that are not necessarily available. So that's why we have those issues and regulations inside the U.S. So um, with that being said, um, this is how you can access them. So the general classification of CFDs that you'll see with a lot of the MT4 platforms available out there, such as FX Pro, FXCM UK, Alpar UK, Saxo Bank, all these uh, brokers here, the general classification they have of CFDs is usually into commodities, such as oil, such as gold and silver, the precious metals, or they offer indices. You know, you can trade Dow E minis, you know, S&P e minis, NASDAQ, Nikkei, um, sometimes they will offer individual stocks depending on the broker. Some have only the basics, some have more individual stock available for you as well, and they usually have them available as futures. So there's a lot of different possibilities there, but the general classifications that most traders from the Forex market move into is either precious metals or oil, and if they're not in those classifications, they tend to then go to indices as a whole. Very few currency traders all of a sudden just, if they started trading through the currency market, very few of them want to go to a stock because, you know, you're going from something with massive liquidity to a lot less liquidity. You're going to something that doesn't tend to gap into something that does gap a lot. You're going to something that generally trade, you know, something that trades 24 hours a day is something that trades about eight and a half. So with that being said, you know, most Forex traders tend not to like to move into just individual stocks unless they have a fancy for it. That's why they like the commodities or the indices because generally you can get a good 24-hour cycle out of them. So with that being said, it's important to understand the general classifications. As a whole, commodities, believe it or not, tend to influence currencies more than currencies influence commodities. Currencies can have an effect on commodities prices, but it usually is kind of a long-term directional thing. Um, as a whole, commodities, and when I say commodities, I'm talking about oil or precious metals, tend to have a much greater influence or effect upon currencies than vice versa, which is a little strange because as a whole, currencies often are larger instruments. You know, a, a euro is a far larger market than, say, oil. 
or gold or silver. So, you know, it kind of makes it a little strange as to why the larger one is affected that. Because, and part of that has to do with commodities tend to be such powerful components of the value for that particular country or currency that when they tend to be influenced, then they tend to really be a major player in the value of that currency. But as a whole, it's important to understand that CFDs tend to influence currency prices more so than currency prices influencing CFDs. Again, also, though, that is a correlation, not so much a causation. So it's important to understand that that falls within that relationship. The There are some underlying factors that tend to influence commodities more so than the indices class of CFDs. With commodities, the things that tend to influence commodities valuations and prices that we see usually have to do with supply and demand or overall risk in the market. So those are some of the things that tend to influence the trading of commodities, spot gold, spot silver, oil, agriculture products, usually has to do with supply and demand and risk. Why? Because commodities are a finite supply. There's only a finite amount there. Therefore, supply and demand has a much greater influence on it. However, with indices, we don't quite see that. Because if there needs to be, generally, there can be more contracts available. You know, it's just a question of how much do people really want to buy on it or not. Supply and demand isn't as much an influence. Risk, global risk, can be a factor. But the things that affect indices, indices can be affected by individual sectors within that index, such as technology stocks or financials or anything like that, or te- you know any, any different sectors. But it can also be affected by things going on inside that country, things going on regionally, or things going on globally. Let's say there's a massive concern about risk going on in the markets. There's a lot of concern that, you know, China's overheating and all these markets are overheating and we're running out of this and this and that. Global indices will tend to be affected, regardless of kind of what's going on in their individual country or sector. So global risk can have an effect on that. Also, if the Tokyo, if in the Tokyo session the Nikkei gets hammered, and the Hong Seng gets hammered, and the Shanghai gets hammered, the Shanghai Composite gets hammered, then there's a pretty decent chance that the European indexes, indices are going to get hammered as well, and that may carry over into the U.S. market. So you have a lot more wider group of factors that can influence indices as a whole, whereas precious metals tends to be a much more compact way of approaching it. You're generally looking at it from supply and demand and then an overall risk factor. Does that make sense how the two, you have to look at them from a kind of a different set of glasses? Does that make sense to everybody? This is before we're even getting into the technical. We're kind of just talking about the overall fundamental structure behind that. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Good. It's important because... You know, again, we're trading a different instrument, so we have to understand the underlying factors that tend to, you know, be the the currents involved in moving this one direction or another. Okay, great. Looks like people are getting as a whole. All right, with that being said, I kind of want to get into the technical things which can influence or how these things tend to relate technically. I have to move away from my Kiwi dollar chart, so... <laughs> Sad about that. The one good thing about trading it in my office at home is I have all these monitors, so I could be watching other things while teaching this webinar at the same time. But here I can. So, okay. With that being said, one of the questions I want to ask is short versus long term. Um, you know, trading short term in index. We're going to talk about indices first, then we're going to talk about commodities, precious metals, oil, and silver. So. In terms of technically trading indices, short term is in some sense a little bit more difficult, and here's why. Indices as a whole are 
very often have much more compact volatility in the sense that, you know, the S&P, you're going to get the majority of its order flow and activity during U.S. stock market session. And even within that session, there tends to be about a one or two hour window within that session where 85 to 90 percent of all the volatility occurs. You're talking around market open, particularly the first half hour on market open, and then also around market close, you get immense amount of volatility. But a lot of that in between stuff isn't that volatile. So you have smaller windows of volatility to be day trading these things and really be making good money on them. As a whole, indices are far more traded long term other than the other than what would be called the high frequency trading which is responsible for a fair amount of volume in the market but other than that indices are much more heavily traded on a medium to long term basis part of that has to do with the nature of who's involved in indices you got pension funds and you got mutual funds and you got all of these very large compact or very large products that they are so big it's very hard for them to be day trading. In fact, a lot of them have to wait to the end of the day before they can execute a trade or the beginning of the next one. So, you know, it's not like they're making, it's not like mutual funds are making five to ten intraday trades a day if they're involved in the S&P. They tend to hold them for much longer periods of time. And so the people that tend to be involved in trading these indices as a whole, there's a lot more people that are trading them long term than short term. So with that being said, from a technical basis, because of the short compact volatility these things have, and because of the players that are generally involved in trading indices, these instruments tend to be much more technically sound on a long-term basis and trading them short-term is a lot more difficult. That doesn't mean there aren't opportunities on the short-term time frames, you know, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, and things like that. But because of the lesser liquidity and the general nature of people taking positions on these things, they tend to be much more smoothly traded as a long-term instrument. Does that make sense based on who's involved in trading indices as a whole? That they tend to be very dominated by long-term influences. Now with currencies, currencies has a lot more variety of players. Yes, you do have players that are trading currencies on a long-term basis, you know, especially some of the big players like Rogers and Buffett, Soros. These people don't tend to day trade these things. They're hold, they buy something and they hold it for a fair amount of period of time. So you do have those players. But the institutional market as a whole is a lot less involved. You don't have mutual funds that have much bigger restrictions in terms of how much they can get in and get out, you know, how much they can, when they can enter and exit positions. These institutions are much more flexible. So there's a lot more intraday trading on currencies than there are on these indices CFDs. Also because it's a 24-hour market it creates a lot more opportunities for order flow to cycle on an individual or intraday basis. So currencies is much, if you're going to trade something on a short-term basis, currencies is some of your best, one of your best instruments to do that. Because the, lo the large majority of the institutional market is much more actively involved in that type of trading. So there's a major difference there. If you want to only be an intraday trader, I generally recommend trading currencies more than I would indices. Not that you can't indices, it's just it's a lot different instrument. And the liquidity is just not as great sometimes. So you're going to get a lot more choppiness on an index than you will on a currency. You're also going to get a lot more gaps on things like that on indexes than you will on currencies, just because of pure liquidity. So in terms of being a more technically pure market, Currencies as a whole is going to be far more technically pure because of the pure liquidity involved than indices will. You're talking as a whole $4 trillion. Now keep in mind that $4 trillion is not all spot. Spot is only about $1.5 trillion a day. Now spot's not the only thing moving the markets, but as a whole, spot transactions is only $1.5 trillion a day. That $4 trillion is not all spot. 
Uh, we'll be getting into gold and uh, precious metals in just a second. So now, in fact, that's actually next on the list. So as a whole, I generally recommend trading the CFDs for indices on four hours and daily time frames. And it's much more suited towards medium-term swing trading and position trading. It's much more, indices are much more suited towards that. It's just the way, it's just the nature of how they function. In terms of, we'll get into that question in just a second there, Biz. So, in terms of commodities, some of these can have some pretty good liquidity involved in them. Oil as a whole is oil as a whole is a very well traded commodity. It's traded globally. It's something that all kinds of countries have interest in. It's something that almost everybody on the planet is using. If you own a plastic product, which everybody does for the most part, you're involved in oil. Oil is something that is very valuable uh, to some degree, unfortunately, but very valuable to the everyday functioning of all things that we do. So oil has a very high demand in the environment as a whole. That's why as a commodity, it's pretty much one of the largest commodities out there in terms of actively trading and participation. Gold is also pretty active, but definitely not as much as a whole, and then silver way less than gold. Keep in mind, it was when we had that big sell-off in silver, it only took about, what was it, 30,000 tons to affect the price of that. There's no way 30,000 tons would affect gold that much to create a 33% drop in the value of it. Um, it just wouldn't happen. So, you know, silver is a much smaller market. Now, in terms of trading gold and silver short-term versus long-term, they do have a lot of underlying, I guess you can say, fundamental reasons that they can be driven in one direction you know, long or short, based on the fundamentals or the macroeconomics of it. But there is a lot of, there's a lot more speculation on a short-term basis on gold and silver and oil. There's just a lot more speculating as a whole. Because a lot of the people that are trading these instruments aren't necessarily confined by the big bulky things that mutual funds and pension funds have in terms of trading and things like that. There's just a lot of speculation going on in that. So with that being said, these are things that you can trade much more viably from a technical perspective on a shorter term basis. I tend to prefer four hours and daily charts for trading pretty much anything. No matter what instrument I'm working on, the four hours and daily time frames tend to be just consistent and accurate as a whole. Whereas some instruments, I, if I needed to, I could trade off of one-hour time frames. But other instruments, I would feel that they weren't really set up for that. So it's important to understand that there are those differences between the two. Does that all make sense there? And I want to get in a couple of these questions here. Hopefully I've given you some information, Milo, about gold. But does that all make sense to, to everybody there? Cool. Cool. Okay, BIS says, why not trade a currency or index ETF which is regulated through an exchange? Well, first of all, you're going to get better pricing and better execution by trading a currency through a non-index because you're going to have a lot more players that can offer liquidity. Um, you know, whereas an index, you only have so, or a currency that's traded through a regulated exchange you're going to have a lot less liquidity available. That's why currencies are so much more liquid as a whole, and you're going to get much tighter pricing on that, is because you have so many people that you can choose from. You know, a lot of brokers have what is called a trade aggregator, where they, you know, they are circling through 12 of, you know, the world's largest banks to say, who's giving you the best price on that particular currency at that time? Who's got the most liquidity? Who can give it to you? Whereas an index, you're stuck in a much more contained environment when you're trading through when you're trading through exchanges. As a whole, I generally don't like trading through exchanges, and the reason being is because if you understand how a lot of exchanges work, they are much more easily manipulated 
anybody who trades stocks, um, if you know anything about what a specialist does, you will pretty much understand that the people who are specialists in many of the exchanges, they are the biggest manipulators in the industry. It's, it's ridiculous some of the things that they can get away with. You know, for a long time, there was a law in place that these specialists who are basically people, the only way you can get these jobs unless you're born into the family or you know somebody in the family, basically, these are people that are kind of working pretty much on the exchanges there, and they're seeing all the liquidity and order flow coming through. So if they see an order, if they get a bunch of orders to come in that they have to fill, they could actually wait a minute, actually it was two minutes, before they could execute the order. Price could change dramatically in two minutes. And if they see a really huge order coming in, they can say, ooh, this looks like a good buy. They buy it. They get their orders in early. Then they execute the order flow to come through. And then they're just riding the wave of those people that came in before them. So exchanges, because of it being a much smaller environment, decreases competition. And it increases the possibility of things getting manipulated from the inside. Whereas if I have 12 different banks that I can choose from, well then, you know, if one bank's not giving me the price I want, I still have 11 others that I can choose from. And I like that to have more options. You know, when you go to buy something, you know, if you want to go buy a car, you probably wouldn't like it if there was just one dealership that was offering that. You want the option that there are multiple dealerships so you can take advantage if somebody's going to give you a better price. So I generally don't prefer trading currencies or indexes through exchanges. I generally like, in the sense, I generally like index ETF. Um, I generally like having options. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, also, when you're trading them as CFDs, the chances are you can get a little bit more leverage than you could if you were just trading them directly through an index, through an exchange. So that's something to consider. That's kind of the whole point of CFDs, and that's why it's such a hot-button topic inside the U.S. because of the leverage that is offered. And let's face it, if you grew up and you started trading financial instruments through Forex, you like leverage. You're used to leverage. It's something that you were using from day one. And so to go from 100 to 1 leverage to 10 to 1 leverage is a big shock for people. And it could have a big effect on your risk reward, your money management, everything. So with that being said, it changes the nature of the game based on the fact that you generally have a lot less leverage when you're trading direct as opposed to trading a CFD. Does that make sense there? Yes, no? And did everybody get, uh, it seems like everybody got the whole thing about the technicals. Yes? Okay, fantastic. So, with that being said, I want to talk about if you have seen any of my webinars over the last four years, and I hope you have. If you haven't, shame on you. But I have a ton of recordings, and two of the strategies that I have been championing for the last four years here is Ichimoku trading and price action trading. And so if any of you have been following those methods and those things and looked at all those videos, you know, maybe you've gotten a feel for one or the other. Maybe you like both, maybe you use both. And what I wanted to do is really talk about how well these instruments or these techniques or systems tend to function on this group of CFDs. So I want to start off with, now Kisi says, did you write an Ichimoku book? Not yet. Um, my publisher has my Price Action and Pivot Points book. He was on vacation traveling in Central America. He's just gone back, so now he's doing heavy work on my book to hopefully getting it out soon. Once that's done, um, you know, and kind of out the out the door, I'm going to take about a one to three month period off, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time working very heavily on the Ichimoku book. Um, but when I write this Ichimoku book, um, the plan is is that I kind of want to write a tomb, you know, in the sense of uh, I want to write a really book big book on it, and I want to cover all instruments, 
and I also want to be working off the translations that I have from the most each from not only the the Ichimoku books that are out there, but also the um, the original one as well, which I have a copy of. It's a massive book. It's 1,000 pages over four volumes. So I want to really kind of hammer into those books, and then I really want to write a massive book on Ichimoku. There's actually a lot of things I'd like to do with it. I even want to create uh, a new indicator to be added to the Ichimoku cloud as a whole. So there's just a lot of things I want to do with that. I feel like the literature out there in terms of the books that are out there have really been subpar and they really didn't offer that much new material and they really just they really underperformed. You know, some of them really underperformed, some of them did okay, but I don't see anything out there that is just you know, the reference book. You know, where people say, "Wow, this is the book." You know, kind of like Neeson was able to create a book that is the book on candlesticks, you know, to some degree. Um, you know, I want to create that book, and if I'm going to do that, I want to really work on that one. So that's my next big book project, but that's going to take some time. I plan on going to Japan, doing a lot of interviews with top traders there, um, you know, and so, and then I also have to talk about it with my publisher as to how we do it. And as Philip J. said, do publishers like to stretch a topic like this across several books these days, not write a big book? You know, that's an important question. It really depends on, um, you know, do we want to create a massive work like, a, you know, something that has maybe a few volumes to it or the Ichimoku Bible or there's many different approaches we can do. We can do one book that is just pure quantitative strategies on Ichimoku. We can do one that is um, just, you know, interpretation, translation of it. We can do one book that's just the translation of the original text, which has never been translated into English. So with that being said, um, you know, there's a lot of ways we can do it. And there's one other important question is, how do we integrate these new books with the new forms of media that books are being presented? Right now, electronic books are outselling paper books uh, for the first time in history. And I don't expect that trend to reverse anytime soon. I expect it to accelerate. So do I create a book that is built for more um, electronic media, you know, more of uh, an e-book style you know, for the iPad or the Kindle? Or do I even include it? Uh, in such a way that um, where I, if I do it for electronic, you know, media, do I crude it with certain flash animations or things like that, you know, which can make it a lot more interesting. So there's, there's a lot of ways um, that it could be done. Um, so hopefully answers your question. But we're getting off topic here. So with that being said, the... I won't talk about these instruments as a whole and how they tend to work on Ichimoku. Um, and then we'll go through all the instruments, we'll go through the indices, we'll go through the commodities, we'll go through the metals and everything like that. Um, and then we'll go over price action triggers as a whole and how they tend to function. I would like to say, you know, in some sense I could make it easy that Ichimoku tends to do really well on four-hour and daily time frames across all these instruments. But it's not entirely true. Um, Ichimoku tends to do really well. And let's start off with oil. Then we're going to work on um, gold and silver. And then we're going to work on um, we're going to work on indices after that. So Ichimoku as a whole, believe it or not, doesn't tend to do super fantastic. It's, it's good, but it's not fantastic on daily charts for oil. Part of it is because oil can get really volatile and have massive spikes and fluctuations in short periods of time. And the Ichimoku on the daily chart sometimes has a hard time catching up to these massive reversals in volume and volatility. And oil does have that ability to just make a huge dive, mostly because it's such a sensitive issue right now that so many people are really trying to take cues from OPEC and supply and demand. And have we had peak oil? There's a lot riding on the line with oil. And because there is a lot riding on the line with oil, it has the potential to just reverse wildly. And that tends not to make well uh, or, you know, work out well when trading on the daily time frames. However, it's interesting. It does work well on the weekly time frames because those charts can absorb those fluctuations for the longer term theme. Um, believe it or not, it also works really well on the four-hour time frames, and it also works really well on 30 minutes, one hour, and 
five minute time frame, but you have to tailor it and be really skilled at that. So oil showed a diverse range, but ironically it didn't work well on the daily charts. Gold and silver. Let's get into gold and let me get you a chart on that one there. Gold tended to, and silver tended to function a lot better on daily charts. Kumo breaks tended to be much more, um, much more solid when they did break. They tended to produce much more lasting breaks, whereas oil was much more choppy on that. Tank and Kijin crosses tended to continue a lot more under gold and silver, um, but not so much on oil. Um, so even though gold can have a lot of volatility, its overall trending structure tends to be a lot more stable. Um, whereas if you think about it, oil, you know, went from thirty dollars up to one hundred and fifty, and then just got hammered all the way back down to you know sub forty, and is right back up a hundred again. So, you know, we're not seeing those wild fluctuations in gold. We're seeing a much more continual, long-term trending type thing in place, and that tends to lend really well for it performing well on Ichimoku. So on dailies and weeklies, gold is exceptional. Four hours, not bad as well. Once you get on the really shorter time frames, like 30 minute, one hour, five minutes, things like that, Ichimoku's effects tend to break down because gold on an intraday basis can be very volatile. That's why there's a lot of wicks uh, involved on those smaller time frames. Uh, whereas other instruments, you may not see it. Like Aussie dollar tends not to have as many wicks on those larger time frames. Um, or on the, even on the four-hour time frames, it's much more closed towards the highs and lows. So gold is something that tends to be much better traded on four hours, dailies, and weeklies. Not so much as malleable in the intraday time frames, but oil can be because of the sensitivity uh, it has globally right now. So does that make sense between those two, between gold, silver, and then oil as a, as a whole? Yes, no? Okay, great. Fantastic. With that being said, let's move into indices. Okay. <clears throat> Believe it or not, um, Kumo breaks tend not to be super effective, and we're talking about right now, we're talking about the the mini Dow, um, Dow e mini. So Kumo breaks tended not to be an effective structure or methodology for trading the mini uh, e-minis on the Dow for the daily time frames. Weekly time frames it did, and tank and Kijin crosses tend to be very solid as a whole um, on the daily time frames and weekly as well. So they were pretty stable. Also, four hours tend to function really well, but then the time frames, there's a gap there. The one hour 30s and 15 minutes tended to function really well because of Again, the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P, the largest amount of order flow is during the U.S. session. And during the U.S. session, there's about two hours as a whole where you're going to see 85 to 90 percent of all the volume and volatility. So because of that, those small candles tend to produce some pretty good short-term trading opportunities if you catch within that one-hour window. If you don't, it's not going to be as solid. It's going to lag a little bit. So... Those are something that Ichimoku can graft over on these instruments. We're talking Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P as a whole. The Nikkei, Nikkei, believe it or not, you would think it would um, be something that you can trade on all time frames, but it ends up being something that only works really well with Kumo breaks and long-term tank and Kijin crosses it tended to break down on the lower time frames as a whole, partially because there's a lot of gaps involved in that due to lesser liquidity. Um, you know, there was a lot of reasons for that as a whole. But um, because of the general liquidity and gapping nature of it, it's something that you want to trade on the longer time frames. Greg has a question. Chris, which two hours of the U.S. session are the most active on the U.S. indices? Well, if you had to take a guess, I did kind of answer this already, but if you had to take a guess, what do you think would be, Greg? Any, any guesses on that? First and last. First and last. First is because, exactly, first and last. Because first is, you know, where a lot of people are taking the massive positions to start off the day. And also keep in mind, a lot of hedge and mutual funds, or sorry, a lot of mutual funds and pension funds 
they, if they, let's say they want to get out of an instrument, they have to wait generally till close of the market before they can do that, and that's done in the last hour. So, with that being said, um, you know, the first and last tend to be the most active for the stock market as a whole. It's something like mathematically, something that's like 83 or 84% of all of the major price movements that happen in volatility happen within the first and the last hour. So those are your best chances to make money. And if you've ever watched the opening of the stock market, you'll see the first half hour is just crazy, especially if it's a very active session. Um, most of your money can be made there. So that's uh, with the Nikkei. And it kind of makes sense as a whole as well because Japanese investors tend to be much more long-term. Um, they tend not to be trading as much actively on an intraday basis. So with that being said, um, that's the deal with the Nikkei. In terms of other indices, because there are others available, I generally don't recommend trading the other ones because unless you're very familiar with that particular country or region, I tend not to recommend trading it. Why? Because the Nikkei, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, those are something, those are markets and indices that are known globally, that are traded globally. However, um, if you look at, you know, the Spanish, or if you were to take the Italian or the Australian uh, markets and indices, they tend to be something that's much more regionalized. So if you're from Australia, sure, that would be a great idea. But if you're not from that, you're going to have a lot less inside information and understanding of what's going on in that country to trade them. I know one woman who she just trades mostly the Swiss exchanges. So with that being said, you know, for her, she can trade it. Even though I'm a far better trader in her than she is, I would do probably more poorly on the her trading her exchange than she would because she's just so familiar and knows so much about the markets there internally. And I'm 10 times the trade that she is. Uh, DAX is something that is known globally, but it's not going to be traded as much as Dow, S&P, Nikkei. Um, you know, as a whole, those are much more um, broadly based markets. So hopefully answers your question on that. But DAX is something that would, would fall into the category of, yes, globally known, globally traded kind of thing. Um, so that's pretty much what I have to say about the indices as a whole. Now, in terms of price action triggers, let's get let's start from the top down and work our way in again. Let's get back to oil. Okay, I have a lot of price action strategies, particularly quantitative strategies, that I can pretty much plug an instrument into my MT4 algorithms, and then it can spit out a bunch of numbers and tell me how those formations work quantitatively on those instruments. And believe it or not, um, the price action strategies that are incredibly powerful on Forex are not as strong, and they don't always, but they tend not to produce as high a percentages as they would on these commodities and indices. Why? It really comes down to liquidity. Because the currency market is a much more liquid market, you have a lot smoother price action, and therefore you have a, a much more, much smoother market technically. The smoother the market is technically, the more finesse you will have around trading them from a price action perspective. So with that being said, um, you have to be a lot more picky when trading these pr same price action triggers from currencies as opposed to as opposed to uh, indices and commodities. Gold actually did not test really well for price out of all these price action triggers I have, unless you were trading on the daily or weekly time frames. Anything less than that, and there was massive breakdowns in the statistics. Massive. If you were trading silver, they tended to perform a little bit better, but statistically, they were not that much better. Um, again, it was something more like dailies and weeklies, and then four hours, there were some acceptable 
and solid numbers uh, from a quantitative perspective as to how these formations played themselves out. Gold, much less. And that's probably because the gold is much more volatile than silver as a whole. Um, as a whole, you see a lot more intraday speculation and volatility. But um, silver tends to be a little bit smoother as a whole. Um, in terms of oil, the price action triggers, again, were much more limited to daily charts. It did have some four-hour quantitative signals that performed decent. But there were certain quantitative statistics and figures that I could get on currencies that would tell me anywhere from 60 to 90% chance that they were going to trigger. It was much harder to get anything above 80% on oil or gold or silver. So that tells me that the liquidity and the volatility and the extremities of them, much harder to trade from a price action perspective. So you have to be aware. It's not that price action is less effective. It's just there's less liquidity. It's not a defect in price action. It's a defect of liquidity. So if you have a really good price action setup that you trade on currencies and it's very successful, don't expect to just graft it over and it's going to perform just the same. It's not. It's going to be very, very different. Statistics vary wildly for in comparing CFDs to currencies. The indices, even more so, um, because you know, particularly the Nikkei um, and any of the more the more outer ones, because they have a lot less liquidity, they have a lot more gaps. So, if you think about it, when do you see gaps in currencies? Once a week. You know, market open. When do you see gaps in some of the stock markets? You could have it from day to day. The Nikkei could gap wildly from one day to the next. You could have several gaps within the same week. That would almost never happen in currencies. So because of that, a lot of these price action triggers can just get kicked because of the pure nature of the gaps. So with that being said, um, I generally don't like trading, particularly on the Nikkei, price action triggers that are on the daily charts because of the fact that it likes to gap so much. Once the gap has occurred, then it's not as bad. But if you're trying to trade in between one day to the next, you can oftentimes expose yourself to a gap, and that's something you have to be very concerned about. So that's something that I would watch watch out for. Um, and as a whole, price action triggers tended to break down under a daily chart on almost anything except for Dow and S&P E-minis. Um, I only found one price action trigger to actually be workable on the on the NASDAQ. Um, the Dow S&P and Dow and S&P's E-minis tend to work really well because there's a lot of liquidity on them. Again, it comes down to liquidity. Price action triggers work really well as long as you have a really liquid environment. You don't have a liquid environment, they're not going to work well at all. You have to have something that can smooth out all that volatility. And price action triggers, particularly quantitative ones, work on precision. So with that being said, that should give you an idea and a little bit of heads up as to when you're trading them. You may be a fantastic price action trader in Forex, and you start grafting it over CFDs, and it, I, the chances of your accuracy numbers working exactly the same from one to the other are next to none. Statistically, I just don't see how it would work out. So that's what I have been able to reveal through my studies on that. Okay, so that pretty much covers... Um, what I wanted to for today. Uh, with that being said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. You guys didn't ask too many questions, which either is a good or bad thing. But we were able to get a full hour in and go after and go longer, so thanks to FX Street for allowing us to go a little bit longer. Um, every week, except for this week, uh, I will be posting once a week my uh, uh, report, and it's a combination of price action and Ichimoku analysis across currencies and CFDs. So if you have questions and would like to take a look at that, check us out, secondskiesforex.com. And if you have any further questions about our courses, and we are now starting to bring strategies in to trading CFDs, proprietary quantitative strategies, email me at info at I have all the material done. I just need to 
arrange everything with my tech guy to get them loaded up to the site. So uh, that's all I'm working on right now. But we have new proprietary strategies just for trading CFDs, silver, gold, oil, indexes, everything. So if you're interested, check us out and email me directly. Until then, thank you all very much for coming. I bid you all adieu. Good luck trading, and I'll see you next week. Take care, everyone.